Good morning. Welcome to worship. We're glad to see all of you with us in person and online. God bless everybody. We want to uh, welcome those of you who are here for the first time. We're grateful to have you with us, also in person and online. Uh, at the end of each row in the front section or uh, in the back on the table, there's some blue cards. Uh, these are for multiple purposes. One, uh, we can get information if you're new. We'd love to get to know you better. And also, I'd like to meet you afterwards, and we have a gift bag for you if you uh, come see me. And then, but there's information, but you can put that information, but on the one side, there's prayer requests. And we honor these, so if you have a prayer request of any sort for yourself or anybody else, you can put that, fill that out. If you check the box that says forward to the prayer chain, I'll send it out this afternoon. Uh, if you hand it to me, if you have a prayer concern that's urgent, I would hand it to me directly, and then that way I can get it out there today. Um, otherwise, you can put it in the, in the collection boxes in the back. But there's also some responses you can do, like about your faith journey, accepted Christ, uh, about things you want to know about our church, and so on. So that's, those are available to you today. Uh, remember, we have Holy Communion each week in this service. Uh, if you're at home, if you have some liquid grape and bread, just follow the instructions later on I'll give you, and you can have communion. In person, you can take one of two ways. There'll be two stations down front. You'll come down, and uh, if you come down front, they'll hand you a piece of bread. You'll dip it in the juice and then take both elements together. Uh, if you want, prefer, you have, we have pre-filled communion cups. They're in the back in the center table. There's uh, the top one tab, the dimple tab gets you to the wafer. The other tab gets you to the juice, and I'll give you instructions at the appropriate time. Uh, offering is given also by that center table on either side of the table in this pedestal boxes. There's a slot there. Just drop your gift in there. Uh, and then you want tax credit. You do, do need to use an envelope or a check or some identifiable way for us to know who you are. Uh, at home, uh, you can give, and you can also do this in person, electronically. Go to our website. People mail checks in and so on. And we're grateful to all of you for your generosity. A few quick things. Uh, we're upgrading the sound system next door. Uh, we've done a lot of upgrades in here. We're doing some upgrades over there, and uh, uh, most of you attend only this service, so this doesn't apply to you. But if you do attend back, back and forth, uh, we have uh, it's $25,000 to upgrade to this uh, array of speakers, and it's going to really help out. We tried them out at Easter. It was a huge improvement. Uh, we're at now we need 23.8, and if, I, if uh, the checks come in today, I promise we'll be down to like 18. So uh, if you want to help support that, you're welcome to do so. Uh, we're selling T-shirts, and is Beverly, where's Beverly at? They're in the back. They're in the oh, up there. Oh, gosh, there, you, there she is. <laughs> she will have some T-shirts if you want to help get our name out there. They're uh, dark gray, and I think there's some white ones also. You can buy, donate them, and then we're going to have other things we're going to be putting out also for, you, for us to get our name out there. So see Beverly afterwards in the back, and she'll be happy to sell you a T-shirt. Uh, Let's see here. Uh, there's a concert this afternoon at 3 o'clock next door. Uh, basically movie tunes and so on. Rogers and Hammerstein type stuff next door, 3 o'clock. Uh, and uh, Mark Schmidt will be the concert uh, giver, so provider. Uh, Bike Fest is coming in two weeks. Very important to remember, we only have one worship service that morning at 10 o'clock. And it's going to be over in the family life, I mean, a san sanctuary. Uh, we're in the family life. So over in the sanctuary next door, 10 o'clock. Our worship team plus others will be having a concert Saturday night at 7 o'clock in front of the traditional sanctuary. Uh, and so that's what they're going to do in traditional service. But everybody's welcome, to, of course, 10 o'clock. And you won't have any problem getting in and out of town Sunday morning. So the, the, they have a late night concert Saturday night. There's a big concert 1 o'clock Sunday next on the 28th. But you should be able to have no problem coming in, and you'll be going out the correct direction on the way in. You won't be fighting the crowd. They'll be coming in. You'll be going out. So you shouldn't have any problem. So don't say, bike fest. I sleep in. I can sleep in. Come on out. Be with your brothers and sisters. It'll be a great time. Uh, so come on out and do that. And if you want to sign up to help park cars on Friday, Saturday, you can do that in the back there, and they'd love to have you sign up. May 19th, just put that on your radar. It's also one service. We're celebrating our grad graduates and scholars. It's going to be next door. It's going to be a beautiful service and a family fun day afterwards. Everybody invited. Hope you'll stay for that. I'm going to be away Monday through Friday this week uh, for continuing education. I'll be traveling all day tomorrow and th Thursday night or fr wee hours Friday morning, so uh, just be aware of that. Uh, and so let's uh, recite together our mission statement. Connecting people to God's transforming love through worship, discipleship, fellowship, and service. It's an act of fellowship. Let's say hi to somebody and see if you can find somebody you never met. And that means you got to move, if you're willing, if you're willing. So.
Well, good morning, everyone. How are we doing? I just want to reiterate, um, I've gotten to hear Mark in person, and I highly recommend that you go see him today. He is fantastic, a really, really good singer, so it should be a great time. Uh, I want to welcome everybody here. It looks like everybody got to socialize. Hopefully you got to meet somebody new. Um, if this is your first time, I'm Austin, and now you've met me. Um, and we're just glad that everybody's here. We'd ask you to stand as we enter into worship. Every soul, every beating heart, every nation and every tongue, come find hope in the love of the Father. All creation will bow as one, lift their eyes to the risen sun, Jesus, Savior forever and after. This is love. Jesus came and died and raised his life for us. Let our voices rise and sing for all he's done. Our fear is overcome. Our God is love. Every distant and broken heart, every prayer, every outstretched arm, finding hope in the love of the Father. It's you age, let his praises rise, all in glory for all of time. Jesus, save you forever and now. God is love. 
thank you, Lord, for pursuing us relentlessly with an amazing love that's sufficient to cover over all our woes and ills and sins to make us ready for your eternal kingdom. Thank you for a love that's so rich and strong. It's not, it's not a little bit, but it's enough that if we will receive it, that it can overflow out of us into the community. Thank you for a love that, uh, that can tear down mountains and go through valleys and rivers and streams and life's hurts and troubles and strongholds. And we thank you that you love us relentlessly. We pray that you would help us to love the same kind of way. You've called us to love our neighbors and even our enemies. We struggle with that. But you didn't struggle loving us even when we rebel. So we pray that you would help us to find a way to follow you in the life you've called us to. One that, uh, as John Wesley said, the love of God shed abroad in our hearts is the hallmark of a Methodist. Give us courage to, to be that kind of uh, servant. We pray for our uh, family members and friends who do not know you, who may be apart from you, and we pray that they would hear somehow the love of Christ from us and from others. And help us, Lord, to be in our community bearing witness to the good news. We pray for our family and friends among us and uh, near uh, those uh, far and wide as well that we love so dear that are hurting who are sick, who need healing. We pray for strength and mercy and peace. We pray for the General Conference of the United Methodist Church, which will begin here in another week or so. We pray that, uh, that there'll, there'll be peace there. There'll be calm. That our leaders would lead well. And there'll be wisdom there. We pray, Lord, for healing of wounds that may, uh, may uh, bubble up to the surface there. And we pray for that for ourselves as well. We pray uh, now for our friends and neighbors who are sick. We invite you to pray for persons you want to pray for. You can name their names out loud or you can uh, uh, pray for them silently. Father, we thank you for hearing our prayers. We pray them in the name of Jesus and pray now as he taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's reaffirm our faith as we recite together the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence shall come the judge, the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I believe we have our children's video now. Right? No? No children's video. Okay. Pardon? Oh, that's right. I think we said yes. So, so, so. so uh, we're going to now uh, go on. Uh, we're couple weeks into this series, it's not a series, but uh, every week the sermon for a few weeks has this in common. It's a, the, it begins with the questions Jesus asked, and he asked lots of questions. We're not going to be able to even remotely cover all of them. Uh, we're going to recover quite a few, though. And today we're going to do uh, one uh, that relates to love, and you probably figured that out with the first two songs. The theme today <laughs> is love. This is from the Sermon on the Mount, chapter 5 of Matthew's Gospel. And I'd remind you that frequently Jesus was uh, not speaking so much to crowds as he was to his people who already said they're his followers. And that's the case with the Sermon on the Mount. There were crowds of people who were there, overheard the message. But according to Matthew, 
it says at the beginning of the sermon, his disciples came to him and he began to teach them. Did you get the idea? So there's this crowd out there listening in, but his primary focus uh, is, because sometimes we read these passages in the Bible, so oh, he must be talking about somebody else. No, he's talking to us. Everybody got that? <laughs> and so uh, chapter 5, uh, verse 43 you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, here's the question, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Don't, do not even pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. This is the word of God for the people of God. Let's, let's pray again. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts bless you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So uh, when I approached this passage this week and I was working on uh, the sermon, I, I thought the first thing I asked myself was, well, what's an enemy? Now, I'm going to tell you why it's the wrong question in just a second. But uh, I thought to myself, well, what's an enemy? So I got my commentaries out and I'm, I'm reading, trying to find out, okay, they're going to identify the word enemy. Because I had in my mind what I thought an enemy was. So I was looking for, is it an enemy combatant like in a war or is it your neighbor? You know, what, what's, what does it mean by enemy? Turns out, commentators... Figured we knew what an enemy was <laughs> because they didn't hardly address it. Now, if I'd have dug around for a while, I could have probably found somebody to say, well, an enemy is this broad category of people and so on and so forth. But as I was thinking about it, I realized me trying to find out the definition of an enemy is me trying to get out of loving them. Now, the reason I thought that was because, remember Jesus tells us uh, when he's asked about uh, what the greatest commandment is in Luke's gospel, chapter 10. And he says, what's well, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And there's this, this legal expert in the old law was standing there. He's the one who asked Jesus the question. And so then uh, the expert in the law says, well, then who's my neighbor? And Jesus tells him the story of the Good Samaritan. And as it turns out, in that particular context, the question, who is my neighbor, is the wrong question. The question is always, am I a neighbor? Not who is my neighbor, but am I one? And that's what Jesus did with the parable of the Good Samaritan. Today, similar kind of thing, and I got reading uh, this passage again. I'm going to read it one more time to you. But why don't you listen to how many times Jesus said you, like as in you. Right? So I'm going to emphasize you. He didn't emphasize it. I'm going to emphasize it because I think that's the heart of it. You have heard that it was said, love your enemies and hate your enemy. But I tell you, Love your enemies and pray for those who, per who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even the pagans do that. Be perfect, as your Father in heaven is perfect. When you put it in that kind of thinking, at least for me, I thought, wow, okay, he's talking to me. Everybody know he's talking to you? <laughs> he's talking to me. He's not talking about somebody out there. He's not talking about somebody out there who's hate-filled. He's talking to people who have said, I'm going to be a disciple of Jesus. That's us. What do we do with that? What do we do with that? Now, word of caution, I recognize that loving a, a military enemy or a criminal doesn't mean uh, that, that you don't have prison time or you don't have uh, captives and there's all those kinds of things that go with those kinds of enemies. Uh, the state of Florida takes care of their business uh, and the military takes care of those kind of things. But doesn't negate the command did you notice Jesus didn't make a suggestion? He says, now, what I'd really like you to do. He just simply says, do it. Which means that when somebody's in captivity, a prisoner, a criminal, 
we're going to feed them and clothe them and make sure they have their basic human needs met. And if they're a military enemy, we're going to put them in uh, camps that are appropriate and so on. Uh, and that's this carry on love. But most of our enemies aren't like that. Most of us, if we, prob we probably never use the word enemy, but if you think about it, our enemies usually are people who talk behind our back constantly, people poke fun at us, people who may be in the work world, um, always took your ideas and gave themselves credit and you always behind, or you got stepped over by a boss, uh, somebody stepped over you, or you didn't get credit, or you get the idea, it's the neighbor that lives in, in, in your street that it's always causing you trouble because, you know, like we have a dear relative that lives in a neighborhood, and they're so particular in this particular neighborhood, if your tire gets a little bit on the grass, and I'm not kidding you, like even touching a blade, <laughs> that's how bad they are. <laughs> And they're reporting you to the HOA, and you get nasty grams because you're literally tired, touched a blade of grass because it's a little long. Would you call that an enemy? They're trying to make your life miserable. So you can think about a thousand ways. Those are what our enemies usually look like. And Jesus says, and I say, but I say to you, I say to you, do what? Love them. That's tough, isn't it? Don't you agree that's tough? Uh, if we think about, so Jesus, why does he want us to do this? Did you notice he tells us why he wants us to do this in this passage? So that we can be the children of our Father in heaven. Did you catch that? We're supposed to live like children of our Father in heaven. That doesn't mean the Father doesn't distinguish between good and evil and good and bad. Notice, what, he, what does the Father do? Puts rain on the just and the unjust, and he, he loves them all doesn't mean he doesn't notice the difference. We can obviously notice the difference of bad behavior, but he still calls us to do what? Love our enemies so that we can be children of our Father in heaven. So a couple of things that I'd like to say about that. Uh, the first thing is this. If we want to love our enemies, the first thing we have to do is pursue love. Uh, pursue love. Now, when we normally think of love, we have this idea that we're going to pursue the person we're, we're loving. And that's, that's a type, different type of love. That's friendship love. That's romantic love. We have this pursuit. The kind of love that Jesus always talked about was this idea that, that we want the best for somebody else sincerely, even if they're a problem for us. And that requires us not just so much to pursue them, but to pursue love. And if we pursue love, then love will flow out of us hear that if we pursue love and allow the love of god to flow into us it will flow out of us towards the enemy get the idea if we pursue love which means that i'm going to chase down the definition of love i'm going to chase down not just the definition but what it li is like to live it because you can know the definition of love but love means nothing if you don't live it right i mean you can have a, a meeting about love and say okay we've defined love xyz and you had a group of people, 10 of you, and you all leave the room and uh, start hating on your neighbor as soon as you get out there. You, you know what love means. But so the whole, the, whole, the whole of the Christian life is like trying to live this thing. And so pursuing uh, love, uh, which then is this idea of pursuing. Remember the prayer we just prayed? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. What's his will? The nature of God, the scriptures teach us, is love. That's his very nature. Uh, and he lives in community as Father, Son, Holy Spirit. This, fa this community of tri the triune God creates people that God did not have to create because God is complete in God's own self. But he still chose to create people, right? Chose to create love. And from the very beginning, God has tried to find ways to, to put us in relationship with each other. And he models this by beginning his ministry. When Jesus came, he modeled this by creating a small group. We call them the apostles. Jesus called them the apostles. There's 12 of them initially, plus the women, which we don't have many uh, total. There were at least four or five women that followed the camp around and were just as equally part of this mission as the men were. Uh, one of them uh, betrayed Jesus, all, uh, but all, all of them were there, and they, they, they had this community, and Jesus had these close friends because we live in this idea of choosing love. So here, something to think about. So who chooses our behavior? Because what our temptation is, is if somebody treats us badly, we will choose our behavior patterns based on what they do. But Jesus calls us to choose our behavior patterns based on the Father, based on his way of being. Do you see the difference? 
Just because somebody's mean to you don't, doesn't mean you have to be mean back. Every fiber of our being may want to do that. That's our fallen nature, going all the way back to the garden. Uh, that, that's our fallen nature. It says, I want to retaliate. If you've noticed, even Old and New Testament, there's these words that say things like, vengeance is mine, I will repay, not you. Uh, love your neighbor, love your enemy. Uh, and, and so he calls us to do something. Let, we choose our behavior and kingdom values, which includes love, pursuing love. Or as you see on the screen right now, pray for and bless your enemies. That's a, Jesus said that, pray for and bless your enemies. Why pray? Prayer changes you. Healthy praying isn't about, um, uh, God, I have this neighbor, and uh, you need to fix her. <laughs> because if you don't, <laughs> that's not praying for your neighbor. That's you throwing your will on God. Do you see that? See that? <laughs> but rather, what if we say, Lord, I'm, I'm in trouble with this neighbor. I'm in trouble. And, Lord, I just bless her. Help me to be a blessing. Help me to figure out where I, what I need to do in the middle of this mess. Uh, how do I do my side of it? And if it's all on me, let me know that too. What if you begin to pray blessings? What happens over time is your heart softens and changes. That your, your heart for that person is different. It doesn't mean suddenly you're going to be best friends and going to get coffee every day. It might be that. But it does mean suddenly you're not looking at that person and I hate that person. But you drive by, you avoid driving down the street. You see the person driving down the street, you go inside your house and shut the door. All of a sudden it changes because now you're in love with your enemy. We let the kingdom choose our values of how to live in this world. It is a choosing, not a feeling. Is I'm going to pray for my enemy, bless my enemy. I'm going to do that, which is, is that easy? No. And these enemies, sometimes you're in your family, sometimes your neighbors, sometimes your friends, your coworkers, a host of things. Uh, and so it's a way of saying, I'm going to rise above my personal animosities to live kingdom values. Some years ago, I had somebody call and complain. As far as I know, only one person's ever called the superintendent to complain about me. I don't know. There may be more. You may have called. I have no idea. Uh, they don't tell us, <laughs> unless you do something really bad. <laughs> In which case, they call you up and come visit you. <laughs> but uh, well, I just one point. So uh, it was funny, uh, uh, funny, strange. I don't know what you want to call it. I just, I just remember this because it, it had messed with my soul that I, I uh, met this guy and there was this whole conversation and uh, an attack, verbal attack in a restaurant, a very public place, and I was really bothered by that, as you can well imagine. And then I was uh, driving back to my office about nine miles away and I thought, wow, you know, you can just imagine the conversations running in my mind. You ever had that conversation in your brain that you want bad things to happen to people? I wasn't all the evil. I didn't say things like you know, getting a car wreck or anything like that. You know, just stuff like all oh, your hair fall out, stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, just a joke, actually. But, but the idea was, I'm really seething about this guy. I said, I knew the guy was really, didn't, he and I weren't buddies, but I just thought we weren't that bad a shape, I didn't think. Uh, anyway, I called the superintendent when I got back. This guy was so mad and, and yelling at me that I knew he was going to call. Well, he already called before I, before I could go the nine miles. In those days, cell phones weren't that prevalent. He must have went to the nearest pay phone. Anybody remember pay phones? <laughs> you drop your quarter in. For young folks, you used to have these boxes on the side of the road. <laughs> it's strange. It's still today. You pick that receiver up and say, how many people have been slobbered on this? <laughs> Aren't you glad we don't have to do that anymore? <laughs> There's been a few of them like, I'm not touching that. <laughs> Drop your, you. I remember it from a dime to a quarter though. Remember that? It's like, wow, talk about inflation. <laughs> anyway, I, just, I digress. <laughs> I called the superintendent and found out he already called. <laughs> You know, and we talked, and he says, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. And I didn't worry about it after that. A week later, the man had a heart attack. I got a phone call. <laughs> Would you come to the hospital? <laughs> I'll tell you what happened, but I <laughs> could leave you guessing. <laughs> and I said, okay, David. You can go because you're paid, or you can stay home because you're mad. <laughs> Or you can go because you're a disciple of Jesus. I had that conversation within my own being. I'll never forget walking in the room and his wife looked at me and said, I'm surprised you came. 
Seriously, that's how serious this, this accosting was. And I thought to myself, why wouldn't I have come? And I knew why I wouldn't have come. Uh, and I'll share that because I'm somebody because I've been mad before and held on to it for a while. Uh, but that was a test. Not that God caused it, but it was a real test of my own discipleship to love a man who's tried to get me in trouble. As far as I know, there's nothing in my personnel file about the whole thing. Probably they just blew away, but... That's the kind of thing that we have to think about. How do I love my, my enemy? Uh, what do you do about that? We live kingdom values. John Wesley, I quoted this in a prayer a while ago, but there's a long couple of paragraphs. You can go online and, and find, if you type in a character of a Methodist or the marks of a Methodist, John Wesley. And he said this, a Methodist is one who has the love of God shed abroad in his heart by the Holy Ghost given unto him old language right so we'd say it today a methodist is one who has the love of god shed a shed that uh, love of god that flows out of them out of their heart given by the holy spirit uh, love is supposed to flow out of us uh, that that's how we love our enemies it's love flowing out of us because god recklessly loved us we are able to love others uh, and so we're called to live the way the Father called us to live, so we can live like the Father in heaven. I want to share a story about a man named George. Uh, I'm going to close with this. Um, George was one of my favorite people I ever met. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> he was Jesus. Um, it's weird how you, you have a weird grief once in a while. Anyway, George and I knew each other for a long time, and we used to, he's a layman at another church, by the way, Just, uh, but we knew each other, and we would get together and have Long John Silvers at annual conference every year, first day. <laughs> I don't know why he liked Long John Silvers, so, and that's not, restaurant's not even open, but when I was to go to Lakeland, I'd drive by that place and remember George. And uh, so anyway, I stopped by George's house. This has been many years ago, uh, and George had this business he built up from the ground up, hardworking man, and he had this junior partner, this junior guy in his office, and he said, he wanted to, I'm going to sell the place. One of, his, one of his people working for him said, I'd like to buy it. And the man didn't have any money, didn't have the power to go get a loan to buy it, and that's what George was hoping for, because this would be his retirement. I want you to hear that part. It's important to the story. This is his retirement, selling his business. So this junior, junior employee, not junior employee, but this employee that he has, and they were friends, really, and he says, I'd like to buy it, but I can't get a loan, but uh, how about if I just pay you out of the profits over time? George says, okay. And that went well for the first six months to a year. And the man destroyed the business. And now George is retired and his retirement is gone. It happened, I suppose, George told me when I showed up, the Holy Spirit must have sent you. I didn't get a call. I didn't like drive down the roads and the Spirit said, go that way. I didn't have that, although I hear stories like that. I knocked on his door. He says, good, I'm glad you're here. I, the Spirit sent you, had to send you because I just found out and he told me the story. And he's sitting there telling me, he's, he said, I'm really angry right now, uh, but I got to love this man and find a way to forgive him. I don't remember what legal things happened, were there any lawsuits. I don't remember what happened about all that. I just remember George saying, I cannot live the rest of my life. He's making a decision in the moment. I cannot live the rest of my life hating this man because it will destroy me. So I'm going to love my enemy. And he did. He had to get a part-time job. I actually worked for this church years ago, part-time. And he, he worked and somehow loved that man. And when I used to have lunch with him, he was the happiest man I ever met. Because he chose to live as a child of the father. And he calls us to that. Was it easy for George? No. <laughs> the day I met him in his house, he asked me to pray for him so that he could do the thing he knew he needed to do. But the moment it wasn't easy. Just like me walking in a hospital room. That's what most of our enemies are like. So, do you love only those who love you back? That's Jesus' question. Do you love everybody? Most gracious Father, we thank you for loving us, even when we have been unfaithful. 
even when we've behaved like an enemy, thank you for loving us unconditionally. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus proved his love towards us, Paul says, the Apostle Paul says, by loving us while we were yet sinners. And so he's sitting with his friends, his betrayer at the table. All of them he knew was going to forsake him, and he told them so. And yet he still took bread and blessed it and gave thanks to the Father. And he broke the bread and said, take and eat. This is my body given for you. When the supper was over, he took the cup and he blessed it and gave thanks. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let us pray. Eternal God, we thank you that you love us so much. And so we ask that you pour out your Holy Spirit upon us gathered here that we may love as you love. And we ask that you pour out your Holy Spirit upon these gifts of bread and juice that they may be for us the body and blood of Christ so that we will be one with him and know that we are one with him. And may we one more time experience a fresh, a fresh indwelling of grace and love. May your love overflow within us that we may love our neighbors and even our enemies. And this we pray in his most holy name. Amen. I'm going to invite our communion service to come and uh, make ready. And I'm going uh, to invite you at home if you uh, have liquid grape and bread. You can take communion. You take your bread and say, this is the body of Christ given for me. And the juice or liquid grape, this is the blood of Christ shed for forgiveness of my sins. And, and if there's more than one of you at home, I encourage you to serve one another. For those of you with the pre-filled cups, you're taken by pre-filled cups. Dimple tab gets you to the wafer. Other tab the other ju gets you to the juice. Say those same words to yourself that you might experience something of the grace. And while they're finishing setting up, uh, pray for general conference. Uh, you know, when, when the whole big division occurred in UMC, there were people on both sides of the aisle saying things you could tell they thought the other side was the enemy. Tomorrow, I'm going to spend 11 plus hours in the car with one of my good friends, uh, uh, Don, who was an associate pastor here years ago. He and it's in my covenant group. We've been covenant brothers for well over 15 years. He joined the other side. <laughs> He's a global Methodist pastor. He is not my enemy. He's my friend in Christ. That's how we have to live, and I pray for our denomination will be that way at General Conference, that we won't begin to view the global Methodists or anybody else as enemies, but as our brothers and sisters. Come to the table of Christ. If you need prayer, I'll be available down front here. I'll be happy to pray for you for any reason.
Thank you for worshiping with us today on, per, on online and here in person. This week, you might have a challenge. You might not. Remember, there's grace. Ask God to help you love others. And for sure, somebody you're going to meet out there is having a trouble with this. Be a blessing to them, too. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen.